Thank you for worshiping with Crossroads Nazarene Church. For more information about Crossroads, please visit our website at cvcrossroads.com. There you can find out more about our church, online giving, and small groups. You can also find us on Facebook at CV Crossroads, where we will be reaching out to our community throughout the week. Well, good morning. It's good to be able to be together. I was thinking of a passage of scripture as we were preparing for today, and this it's found in Psalm 122, and it simply says this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, I know we're not in the house of the Lord here. We are uh, on online worship. However, there is that, that reality that we are gathering together around the Word of God, and we're worshiping together, and I'm so glad that we have that opportunity to worship with one another. This week, I'd, I'd like us to spend some time talking about the great American pastime. I'm not talking about football or basketball or baseball. I'd like to suggest to you that the great American pastime is stress and anxiety. It's a game that we all play. None of us really like to play the game, but we play it anyway. Often when we evaluate the anxiety we are experiencing, we come away with information as we're thinking about it that causes more stress than we started out with. That's not the goal of the message this morning. The goal today is that we would go from here with a little bit less tension that we would go from here with a plan, a plan to, to reduce the level of anxiety that is in our lives right now. And we all have a lot of anxiety right now for a lot of different reasons. Let's begin with a helpful list of some of the things that happen in our lives when we are anxious. Now, these are indicators that stress has gotten really bad and that you are on overload. As we read these, look and see if any of these top symptoms of anxiety describe you. Number one is decision making becomes more difficult, whether it's major or minor decisions. Two is excessive daydreaming. Third, increased use of cigarettes, alcohol, or prescription drugs. Number four, thoughts trail off while speaking or writing. Five, you live with a fear of a heart attack or a sudden illness. Six, sudden outbursts of anger or hostility. Number seven is paranoid ideas and mistrust of friends. Number eight, you dream of escape all the time. Number nine, frequent spells of brooding and feelings of inadequacy. And number 10, is reversals in usual behavior. If any of these 10 fit us, we're experiencing stress and tension overload. In our culture today, we have come to accept anxiety like it's no big deal when it is a big deal. A Harris survey on anxiety found that one in three Americans say they live with stress every day of their lives. Six in 10 Americans say they experience significant stress at least once or twice every week. This is a big deal because anxiety has an accumulation factor in our lives. Once we felt stress, the next time we experience stress, it has a greater impact on us. And so as we go through life, stress accumulates and has more and more of an impact upon us. Perhaps the simplest definition of anxiety and stress is this. They are the result of carrying too great a load. When we carry too great a weight in our time or in our, with our money or in our relationships or within our employment or within ourselves, the inevitable result is going to be anxiety overload. Today, let's look at the Old Testament book of Proverbs because it has some incredible wisdom to give to us about how to deal with anxiety. Specifically, we're going to look at four things that cause anxiety overload. We're going to consider some practical ways that we can begin to reduce stress right now, and then to reflect also on some ways that we can continue to reduce stress going forward. God wants to help us 
in the anxiety that we are experiencing. First, if I want to have less stress, I need to check my schedule. Anxiety comes from too great a weight, and many of us have too much on our schedules. Anyone with an overcrowded schedule is going to have too much anxiety. I think most of us have had a cir circumstances such as the one that was experienced one time by this guy who woke up in the morning, went down into the kitchen and heard this water dripping. He discovered that the, uh, the pipe to the ice maker had broken and the kitchen floor was flooded. That's a fairly simple repair. And it was a simple repair for him, except that his schedule is slammed. And so he turns off the water spigot to the, to, to the, the refrigerator and leaves it that way for the next few days because he didn't have time to go shopping to get the items to fix it. He's still on a schedule. So finally, between appointments, he goes in and he buys the things that he needs. And it doesn't take long to buy them, just a couple of simple things. But then he went to the front to pay for it, and guess what? He gets in the slow line. The person at the register keeps getting an error code on their card. And finally, for some reason, after repeated attempts, the, far, the, the card works. The next person right in front of him, for some reason or another, needed their, their identity, their, their driver's license, and did not have it, so they sprint out to their car to get it while the guy is standing there. He looks around, thinks about, well, maybe I should go into another, another line, but he realizes all of the lines are at least six people long. So no advantage there. And now he's running late. When we hear a story like that or we experience something like that, we can just feel the tension rising within ourselves because we are all fellow strugglers with overcrowded schedules and too much to do. How are we to deal with that challenge? Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24 talks about what happens when it says, an intelligent person aims at wise actions, but a fool starts off in many directions. Unfortunately, that describes the beginning of many of our days. We start off in about 20 different directions, and at the end of the day, we wonder, how come I can't seem to get things accomplished? We have so much going on that we don't seem to be able to get much accomplished. Dr. Richard Swinson, in his book, titled The Overload Syndrome, quotes a mom who says this. She says, I am so tired, my idea of a vacation is a trip to the dentist. I just can't wait to sit in that chair and relax. I think we would agree if we would agree with what this mom says, that we are overloaded. Our schedule is way, way too full. What is the result of this busyness in our lives? Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says it this way, Being too busy gives you nightmares. It has an impact on the way we sleep, on our productivity, on our relationships. Busyness in our life overwhelms us. It used to be a fairly common statement where someone would say, Well, just go with the flow. And that sounds fine, but it doesn't work when we notice that the flow keeps going faster and faster and we don't know how to stop it. How do we reduce the anxiety of an overcrowded schedule? In Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, we see the words of a prayer, a wonderful prayer. It says this, Teach us to make the most of our time that we may grow in wisdom. That's an incredible prayer to ask concerning an overcrowded schedule. We say, God, teach me to use my time so that I can develop into a wiser person. I can develop into the person you want me to be. God cares about it when our schedule is overloaded. One idea to help us reduce an overcrowded schedule is this. If we want less anxiety, do not add anything to our schedule without subtracting something from our schedule. That makes sense, I believe, because if our schedule is already overcrowded and we try to add something in, something's going to get subtracted anyway. 
So don't add anything without intentionally subtracting something else. In using our time, there is this myth that, is, that we sometimes think about that says this, I can do 5% more. I think most of us think, you know, I can do 5% more. And so when an opportunity comes along at work, we say, okay, I, I will do 5% more there. But that's not where it ends. There's a family commitment. And we say, okay, I'll spend 5% more on that. Then we encounter a friend or a neighbor who needs some help and we say, 5% more. There are mini, mini, meaningful ministry opportunities. And again, we say, yeah, I'll do 5% more. And pretty soon, 5% more at a time, it becomes 40 or 50 or 60% more. If we are going to add 5% to an already overcrowded schedule, we must subtract 5%. This is difficult. Sometimes it's painful. But this one adjustment will help us in decreasing our tendency to overcommit our time. So if we are going to reduce stress, we must carefully and prayerfully check our schedule. Second, if I want to have less anxiety, I must check my finances. Have you noticed that money comes without instructions? There's no instruction book attached to a dollar bill. There probably should be. But fortunately, the book of Proverbs provides us some very useful guidelines for how to use money. As we look through the book of Proverbs, it reveals the fact that money is somewhat like a wild stallion. If we let it control us, it's going to take us on a wild ride throughout our lives. But if we learn to tame it, we will discover the strength and the usefulness of finances, and it can make a big impact on our lives. Proverbs teaches us how to tame this thing called finances. We all agree that when we take on too much financially, it causes tension and incredible conflict. Running short financially causes incredible anxiety. When we make an irresponsible financial decision, it overloads us with stress. So let's see two principles about finances from the book of Proverbs. One of those is found in Proverbs 22.7, where we are given the principle that the borrower is servant to the lender. To have less stress, we must reduce our debt. When we recognize this principle, it really does help us to have less stress. Today, in our country, consumer debt is now at $20.7 trillion. Calculate that down, that is $62,500 per citizen. Simply speaking, that means there are an awful lot of borrowers who are servant to their lenders. Because of this, we need to recognize this principle every time we make a purchase. The borrower serves the lender. So when making a purpose, instead of asking the question, what am I getting? We need to ask, what am I getting into? How long will I serve the lender to pay off this purchase? That's an important question because too much debt causes incredible anxiety. It keeps us up at night when our finances are inadequate. There are a couple of things about reducing our debt that can be an encouragement to us. One of those is to realize that it's going to take just about as long to get out of debt as it took to get into debt. That doesn't sound particularly encouraging, but the encouraging thing about that is that we need to learn to be patient with it. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight, so we should not be trying to find or expect a quick fix. And the second thing that is helpful and encouraging is don't do this alone. Get help. Help find someone who will be provide encouragement to you. And there's some very helpful resources you may have, may have heard of. There's Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace Seminar. There, there's a Bible-centered financial ministry called Crown Ministries that's very good. We also have financial advisors available where we can confidentially evaluate the dynamics of our personal finances. 
You know, if we have a physical problem, we will seek out a doctor for medical advice. But sometimes when we encounter a financial problem, we don't ask anyone for, for advice or perspective or guidance. Trying to f carry a financial challenge without seeking advice and support causes incredible tension. For less stress, we've got to reduce our debt. But that's only half of the equation. There are some people who have little or no debt, but they're still incredibly stressed out about their finances. They're stressed out about holding on to them, about making sure that the finances go here or there. They're concerned about people stealing it perhaps or what's happening with it. So to have less stress, we've got to reduce our debt. And second, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25 instructs us to increase our generosity in giving. It says, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. It is impossible to be holding on to our financial resources so tightly that no one else can be blessed by us. God says that that is not what he wants us to do. God tells us that part of the blessing of financial resources is we can bless and encourage someone with what God has given to us. A generous person will be blessed and will be refreshed. The tighter we hold on to things, the tighter the grip things have on us. But if we loosen our grip on things, they begin to loosen their grip on us. And so for us to lower anxiety, we reduce our debt and increase our giving. We should do both at the same, at the same time. If we say, well, if I do one and then the other, it just won't work. If we think, you know what, I will get my debt problem taken care of and then I'll, I will be generous, that doesn't work. It takes both parts to reduce the financial anxiety in our lives. Third, if we want and I want to have less anxiety, I need to check my words. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 tells us that words have power to bring health to our lives. It says, kind words are like honey. They are sweet to the soul and health to the body. Whether I'm speaking those kind words or whether I am receiving those kind words, they have a healing, uplifting impact on my life. Unfortunately, we know that the opposite is also true. All of us have experienced the stress that comes into our lives because of words. For example, it's a quiet evening at home, things are calm, there's no tension, and then someone says something that has a bit of an edge to it, and somebody else responds with a little more of an edge, and before you know it, you find yourself on the going down side of the communicating communication escalator. What was a quiet, peaceful evening suddenly becomes anxious and stress-filled. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 is a very well-known verse that says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. When I say something that has a little bit of a bite to it, that's a little bit harsh, it begins to stir a pot of anger a little bit in my family. What do you, we usually do when someone says harsh, something that is harsh to us? Well, what we tend to do is we tend to grab our own spoon and stir up the anger pot a little bit more. And then somebody else joins in, grabs their spoon, and stirs it up even more. Pretty soon, we're all stirring that anger pot as quickly as we can. There's anger and conflict and anxiety. But notice the remedy. A gentle answer. A gentle answer stops the stirring. It turns away wrath. And the word gentle here does not mean that we would be quiet and meek and mousy about it. It means to be honest enough with oneself to admit when we are at fault. To be gentle enough to admit that the verbal exchange is at least partially the result of my stirring the pot. But it isn't only communication that creates conflict and stress. Have you noticed how much stress there is a single word that we use and how much it can bring into our life? Have you noticed how much stress the word yes can bring us? 
Hey, can we have the office party at your house this 4th of July weekend? Yes. Well, welcome stress. Can we get this 30-day project done in 10 days? Well, you want to impress at work, so here it comes. Yes. Welcome stress. Sometimes because we want to impress people or because we feel inadequate, or sometimes we just haven't learned how to say no very well, we say yes to things that pile stress up on us. There is one decision we can make about our words that will drastically reduce the anxiety in our lives, and it is this. I choose to shut my mouth. Now, I say this in the kindest of ways. I say that to myself as well as to each one of us. Because when we shut our mouths, it drastically reduces the stress. When our mouth is shut, we are much more able to listen to the other person. We are able to hear what they are saying before we respond. I don't know about you, but it's amazing to me how often I find myself responding to what other people are saying, only to realize that isn't what they were saying in the first place. If I had chosen to shut my mouth for a few moments, I would have known. Here's what the book of James in the New Testament says to us. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So for less anxiety, we check our words. And then number four, if I want to have less anxiety, I need to check my heart. Anxiety can be, definitely be produced by our schedules and by finances and by words. But while those strategies that we've talked about and others can be devised that will help us, at some point we have to get to the heart of the matter. Proverbs 12, 25 observes, An anxious heart weighs a person down. There is a heaviness that comes with anxiety that's inside that's in our hearts. And we can develop new methods, and we can quit jobs, and we can change our lifestyle, and we can even move to a new place. And maybe our anxiety will reduce for a little bit, for a time. But then, slowly and surely, the stress creeps back. It creeps back into our lives, and that happens if we neglect to check our hearts. There are many challenges and promises and, and problems in our lives that indicate a need for us to adjust. Have you ever noticed that? And so we say, I need to adjust, and so we make the adjustment. And when the issue goes away, then it means that we've addressed what needs to be addressed. But there are some other problems that we have to address repeatedly over and over again. When that is the case, it means we need to check our heart because it's a heart issue. For example, if you overload your schedule one time and find yourself in that circumstance and you learn the lesson and you say, I'm not going to do that again, you have learned from a mistake. But if you overload your schedule over and over again, and each time you say, I'm not going to do that again, and then you do do it again and repeat the pattern, it means we need to check our hearts. Let's look at three heart attitudes that create tension. Often, the attitude of pride is at the heart of, of our stress and anxiety. Pride is the attitude that says, I can do it all. And so, we keep overscheduling and overspending and overtalking because we really do believe that we can get it all done. Now, having a healthy sense of confidence is good, but the reality is none of us can do it all. We all have limits. Now, certainly it is true that we can do great things. We can do greater things than we can ever imagine with Christ leading our lives, but we still cannot do everything. In fact, only God is able to do everything. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 is about this attitude of pride that we struggle with. And it says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And the pride of I can do it all leads us to the stress and anxiety of 
it didn't get done. It is an incredible stress reliever to let go of pride and to admit, you know, I do have limits. I'm not going to get everything done. But pride is one of the heart issues that we have to deal with. A second heart issue is that of envy. Envy is the attitude that says, I can be it all. Proverbs 14.30 warns us about envy when it says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. God has given us each enough time and talent to be the person He's made us to be. And so, throughout life, here we are trying to be that person. But then we notice a person who's different than, than us, and we like that person and how they are, and so we think, I can kind of think I'd like to have their talent as well as my talent. And so we try, in envy, to take on their talent as well. And then we notice a person who's getting a lot of attention for something that, that, that they are doing, and we become envious, and we think, I'd like to be them too. Before long, we're trying to not just be ourselves. We're also trying to be four or five or six other people, too. God has given you and me enough time and talent to be the person He's made us to be. When I envy others, when I try to be other people, inevitably it's going to bring too much weight and too much anxiety into my life. Envy will rot the bones. It's a stress inducer in our lives. A third issue of the heart is greed. Greed is an attitude that says, I can have it all. The Bible does not say it's wrong to be rich nor to be poor. It talks instead about having an attitude of contentment whether or not a person is rich or poor. Most of us in our lives are going to experience times when we would have considered ourselves to be okay financially or rich, and other times when we didn't have enough and we considered ourselves to be somewhat poor. God wants to teach us in both circumstances. And the Bible warns us that, that this get-rich-at-any-cost attitude about the love of money and the destruction it can do to our lives. Greed is a mindset that none of us want to admit. It's not something we're, we're really proud of, but it's something that surrounds us and affects every one of us. We have to deal with the influence and the effects of materialism and greed in our own lives. So the question would come up, how do I know if greed has its hooks in me? How do I know? There is a test to know, and it is this. It's seen in this statement. If I think... I have to have that to be happy, whether it's that job, that increase, or whatever. Whenever I think about some thing and say, I have to have that to be happy, that's when I cross the line over into greed. The Bible warns us frequently about this attitude. Proverbs 23, 4, for example, says, Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to control yourself. Proverbs tells us that anxiety never helps us. It hurts us. And whatever victories and achievements and accomplishments we have in our lives, we must realize they did not happen because of the stress. In fact, many times they happened in spite of the anxiety and stress that we were under. Now, I may be able to change my schedule and adjust my finances and improve the words I speak, but only God can change the heart. Anxiety happens when I carry a greater load than I was designed to bear. Pride, envy, greed, and such attitudes are caused when I am carrying a greater load than I was designed for and stress takes place. Anxiety occurs in our lives when we live in a way that we were not designed to live. God tells us we are designed for one basic purpose. We are designed for relationship with Him. If we live outside of this relationship with Him, our lives are going to experience 
unnecessary tension and stress and anxiety. God does not want us to live that way. Jesus, when he came into the world, one of the things he taught and said to us is this, come to me, all you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, in the midst of your anxiety and stress and your worry and tension, come to me, talk to me, trust in me, allow me to be your manager, allow me to be the director, the leader of your life. I know that some hearing this message today, as you have been listening, you're thinking, man, I am so tired and exhausted and depleted. And you would readily admit, yes, I am on an anxiety overload. You're not confident that you are going to make it through another day or even another week. And Jesus Christ says this to you, come to me. You are weary, you are worn out, under a heavy load, I will give you rest. As we close in prayer, I encourage you to take Jesus up on his invitation. He says, come to me. So right where you are in your heart, would you say this to him as we pray? Would you say, Jesus Christ, I'm bringing all of this anxiety all of this stress in my life, and I'm coming to you with it. I'm not going to try to handle it all on my own. I believe that you care about my overloaded, anxious life. I need the rest you promised to me. I want to live differently. Help me to find in you only the strength and the grace that I need to live everyday life. I trust you not only for the good things in my life, God, but I also trust you with the bad and difficult and things that cause me to struggle. So Jesus, as best as I know how, I come to you. I trust in you. I rest in you. Thank you for relieving the tension and anxiety that I experience. In your name I pray. Amen. I'd like to leave a scripture with us to live by this week, a promise as we dismiss. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter seven, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who, knock, uh, who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. I claim that for my life and for yours today and this week as we ask and seek and knock and follow Christ Jesus. Have a great week.